The way I define success, it's failing often, but having the resilience to recover. The struggle is market fit, timing, and how do you actually approach the customer? Today on the show, I'm happy to have Paul Kalatiu. He's the co-founder of Onda AI, where cyber resilience is simplified. You spent $500 million on your first journey into building the cloud. What happened there, Paul? Yeah, early on uh, in my career, I really focused on technology, right? Technology was, it is a big part of who I am and, and what I've did in the past. And a big Fortune 10 company, we were, I was tasked with uh, building out some of the security around our desire to compete with AWS and public cloud infrastructure. We spent a lot of money building out world-class data centers and really taking the IT investments we had as, as an organization and putting them into a public cloud infrastructure architecture. So on paper, it sounds amazing. You have all this investment, you have all this technology. So wh why would someone not want to come and embrace that? And I think what we learned, you know, it ultimately was a bit of a failure. What we learned from that was, or at least what I learned from that was a, a great appreciation for the business of X, business of technology, business of cloud, really the idea that a lot of technology success is really based on an, uh, a better comprehension of what it takes to run the business around that. So that was uh, an important part of my career. And ever since then, I've moved into business-orientated positions. We, so we started this company, Onda, and it's really about how do you take an idea, whether it's insurance or whether it's AI or whether it's cyber, and how do you actually start to build a sustainable business model around it? And that's the part that coming from technology, you just it's, you get blindsided pretty easily. And I've advised about 14 cybersecurity startups in my career. And I'll tell you just, it's not an abnormal threat or risk to innovation. Generally in my time, I've never really not met smart, intelligent individuals with great products. The struggle is market fit, timing, and how do you actually approach the customer with that innovation? That's the hard part for the most part, for at least my experience. So now it's more business model first, product second. Yeah. So how exactly do you de uh, deploy that or how have you deployed it with Onda? Yeah, I, I think first and foremost, it's about defining a, a market fit and, and, and understanding if there's a need. Because as we know, uh, at least from my experience, there's always, especially with the rapid level of innovation that can be done with cloud as in, in a positive light, uh, it doesn't take as much barrier to market entry in terms of infrastructure costs and technology costs to get that technology out there. And when I say out there, I don't mean in the hands of the customer. Out there in terms of, I've got an MVP, why are, why are people not here yet? So before you get to the point, and I think it's actually more important than ever because it's almost easier to fail when, it's, when the friction and resistance to that innovation is no longer an inhibitor. It's almost a moral hazard, which is, I'll just build it, then they'll come. And when you're spending a lot of time and energy to deciding what to build, there's a little pragmatism that kind of comes with that friction. But now that it's easy in, in a couple of weeks with some open source tools and an AWS credit, a credit card in AWS, you can be out, out there. I think it causes a lot, actually a lot more likelihood of failure because you're not as putting as much time into those decisions that you might have in the past. That being said, what we've done at Onda is market research, a lot of time spent with customers. And quite honestly, in terms of hiring strategy, Hiring individuals that have a lot of experience in, in what failure looks like, because what you're trying to do with a startup is not, I, I think I'll just lead with a kind of an anecdote. I think for me, the way I define success is to day two independent concepts. It's, it's failing often, but having the resilience to recover because you can be quick to fail and then just lay on the ground and call that failure. But if you can get yourself up and fail get yourself up. And if you can do that often and, and quick enough and respond quick enough, that's where the success rate uh, becomes higher. However, you don't necessarily have to have all of those failures in your initial startup. You can inherit a lot of failures by having the right types of leadership involved from day one. So collectively, the failure state comes into a, we'll call it a wisdom or an experience that'll allow for a lot of mistakes to be avoided in the first place. When I think about how we approached Onda and the innovation and the idea, we can actually park the idea immediately. Great, we have an idea. All right, that's not the problem. Now it's, do we have the right people that can assure us that we have the right strategy and can they bring 
uh, an ounce of wisdom that might help us to avoid failure. And then of course, foremost, do we have a market that has a need for what we're trying to achieve? Because if you don't have a market, it's not the end of the world. I just think it becomes very difficult for success because now what you're doing is pioneering uh, an industry. And there are a lot of people that, very few people that have been successful, but when they do have success, it's great. Whether it's pioneering EV technology or whether it's pioneering aerospace, there's a lot of pioneers out there that have done basically rattled industries or disrupted industries. But for the most part, uh, from my perspective, the more successful or, or at least the higher rate of success is often there's a market that's out there and it needs to be disrupted in terms of pain points or in terms of inefficiencies or in terms like Apple did not invent the mobile phone, but Apple created a disruptive user experience that, that then the market shifted into. So for me, that's really what we're trying to do is evaluate whether the market is there. If the market's not there, it's just very difficult because now the cost of sale and everything you're doing is all about, let me tell you why this is a problem. If it's not a problem you don't know, now you're having to educate them. I'd rather, at least from my experience, enter into a market where I'm not educating them. They know the problem. They know the pain. So they have the pain. And now I'm the pain relief. And I'm coming with a different type of approach. And that can still be disruptive, but it's just a little bit different nuance in terms of energy level and education level. I like the idea of inheriting the failures of the team you assemble. So when you choose your team, are you looking for, is it people in different industries who have had whole different set of experiences? Like, what is your model there? Yeah, it may be a bit of a cliche at this point in our industries, or at least in our cultures, but diversity is really important. And I don't mean simply just the diversity in certain terms, neurodiversity. Also, I think about, because as the more you can surround yourself with people that think differently than you or have different experiences or corporate, but whether it's cultural, whether it's personal, whether it's economic or employment diversity. All of these things are very critical to ensuring that you don't have confirmation bias towards a certain thought process. In other words, if I surround myself with a lot of people that agree with what I'm doing and they think the way I'm doing, generally that does create some of that, that more traditional HR or, or diversity that we were trying to, as a society and as in certain industries, we're trying to fix. But it also, from my perspective, limits thought process because now it's a lot of people that think that like I do. So now you just have 12 people like me, 12 calls in a room. My idea is going to be great because everyone agrees with it and it really doesn't challenge it. So actually in some of the interviews we we did at, to develop Onda, especially with leadership, there was an individual that we interviewed who challenged me on every thought, on every idea and said, I don't think what you're doing is right. They work for me. They work here because I convinced them during, during uh, the, the parts of the process. But I also leaned in on that candidate because I knew that they were never going to be someone that we hire who then says, I'm on board and let me know what I need to do. It was, it's about being challenged along the path. And if it's done in, an, if it's done in a professional way, it's, it's actually a key trait to have. You want people that are going to challenge your thought process. And, and some leaders don't like that. They don't like to be challenged and they want everyone to agree with them. I don't think that's my leadership style. And, and that's the way I've sought off, out some talent. If you're, if you're tough in an interview and you challenge what was the same, chances are you're going to continue to have that personality within the organization. You obviously want to validate that's not a, a key defining characteristic that causes harm. So it's a balancing act between the idea that you have objection in terms of leadership, but also if they challenge you and you challenge back and you can get to a point of professional agreement and understanding, to me, that's the other part of this that you want to make sure that they can do. If people just always say no to you, then you'll never really have a good dynamic. So a balance in that. Yeah, it definitely is a balance. So what is the pain that you're relieving with Onda? Yeah. So I am a five-time CISO in cybersecurity. So I've worked in uh, cybersecurity my entire career. And cybersecurity insurance is not new to me. It's not new to the industry. But it was, it's a very painful experience. So one, is there a market for it? Absolutely. It's an underserved market, by the way. But it is a growing market that will not go away. There's no organization that wouldn't benefit from having a cybersecurity policy as part of, their, of, a, of a defense and resilience and, and things of that nature. I also forecast that at some point in certain markets, it might be mandatory. Just like driving a vehicle in the U United States requires car insurance in most states, at least where I ever lived and wherever I've known. Maybe there's a state that is not legal, but chances are that's not true. 
at some point, I think the market will continue to grow. But that being said, the way it is done today is very painful in terms of the experience, in terms of the amount of labor. And I also think that it is somewhat prone to a lot of error because the traditional way to get insurance is an underwriter asks me 600 questions about my security program. I spend three to six months articulating in response to what, they are, what, what their question is. They then interpret it themselves. And then you get into this kind of infinite loop of what did you mean by this question? This is what I meant. So part of the challenge is you've got really two industries colliding. You've got practitioners on one side that understand cyber and you have insurance experts who understand risk and actuary and on how to manage risk, but they may not know the technology behind it. They do know how to ask you questions like, do you do zero trust? Do you do two factor? Do you do ransomware? But how you answer it is never something that historically speaking is well understood on, on both sides. So part of it is you've got two humans that are from two different industries interacting. So they're talking different languages, right? So that's one kind of fundamental pain and problem. The other that's more important to me is even if there's an, even if you can get to a, a normalization of a conversation, how relevant was that question five, five minutes, five, five hours, five weeks from when it was done? Because we're in a, we're in a modern digital transformation era. So if you ask a question, what's your assets? Where are they located? And what's the vulnerability state? And then three months later, is that question even relevant or is that answer still uh, salient in terms of the risk that's being underwritten? So we're living in a world where there's a lot of rate of change. So on top of just trying to automate and alleviate some of that conversation challenge that, that we see in the industry, we're also, attempt, we're also approaching the market with a bit of innovation around how we actually evaluate risk. So I won't say that we'll eliminate the 600 questions, but I wouldn't be shocked if the questions that we answer are down to five and the technology that we're hooking in is on a continuous basis. And so we're not really doing a Q&A anymore. We're just asking for permission to access the technology and audit the technology through an automated observation. And so what does this mean? So that's what we're, how we're relieving the pain, but it may still not be clear on what that actually means. So analogies is sometimes how I like to describe things. So the analogy I like to use is I can say to someone, do you own a, do you own a Ferrari? And they can say, yes, they own a Ferrari. And I can write risk based on that, based on your age, your demographic, your likelihood of being either buying a claim, meaning you get into an accident. So that's one approach. That's how the, a lot of the insurance, car insurance market works today. It's no different than cybersecurity. However, you, what we're seeing in the car insurance market uh, specifically is Progressive has their safe driving program where you, with your permission, you put a little box in your vehicle and they're monitoring your driving pattern. And Tesla, who is a telemetry driven technology with AI and self-driving and all the things they're doing, also uh, entered into the automotive insurance market by giving customers better discounts because they were trying to prove the underwriters that these cars are safe. And, and it was new and, and very expensive to replace. So the policies were very high. The premiums were very high for the initial Tesla owners. I own a Tesla. And at one point, I remember trying to get car insurance. It was very difficult because it was an unknown risk. And cyber, by definition, is an unknown risk, by the way. Uh, part of the issue in the industry is you can't look pa at previous incidences and they can't inform the future. And a lot of insurance is written on claims data and previous uh, issues as res to inform future issues, which works when you're underwriting a property in, in Florida and you're going to determine the likelihood of a hurricane, you can look back at 200 years of weather patterns to make a determination on what's going to happen in the future. In cyber, we don't have that. Even if you have the data that says forensically, this is what happened, that has no bearing on what the future risk is going to be for an organization. It's just fundamentally a challenge in the industry. So instead of looking backwards, why don't we look at real time, right? And so in the driving industry, they're doing the same where they're monitoring your driving behavior. And now it's individual risk, not demographic risk. In other words, it's not you as a good or bad driver in general, and whether or not the Ferrari has a problem, it's you in the car, in the cockpit, and we're now monitoring you. So if you look at a race car driver, everything is driven by their individual performance in that vehicle, but yet every vehicle driver performs differently, but they can create predictions on whether or not a deer jumps in front of you and your reaction time. So we're doing a similar thing in cyber where we're getting past the idea that we're going to ask you whether or not you understand cyber and we're going to measure it through observation. 
in real time. So we'll connect to your infrastructure and we'll determine based on your, how you use those technologies, whether or not you are doing one, what you say you're doing, and to some degree, how well you're doing it. And it sounds like it might be big brothery or things that people won't do, but the reality is they also want to know because these organizations are spending millions of dollars on these technologies. I used to be the global chief security officer for Palatine Networks for five years. People are spending billions of dollars with that company to protect themselves. And if they don't use that technology, they should be the first to know that. You want them to know that. And so this whole insurance model, uh, fundamentally what we're doing is changing it from this idea that we're getting good, good at, at denying you a claim or getting good at predicting risk and becoming more, more aligned in terms of let's do this together. Because if you can get good outcomes, we get good outcomes. And, and healthcare is an example, the last example, and I'll let, open it up again. If we just get good at treating a patient in a heart surgery and getting really good at managing the cost of heart surgery, that doesn't really help the patient. The patient just had heart failure. And so in the healthcare, in the U.S. healthcare market, we're shifting to ACO and performance-based insurance to avoid and prevent some of these clinical uh, diseases, these epidemics, if you will. And so what does that look like? It looks like the healthcare insurance is offering you a gym membership or they're offering you a Fitbit, whatever it be. The goal is to get that data that in creates insights towards prediction. And now you can actually take data and be predictive with it because now it's, it's me as an individual, my behaviors that will then determine the likelihood of heart failure. And if we can do things early on when you're younger or early when you're making these sizable security investments, there's usually a mutual incentive. Now you're creating an incentive with the client to say, look, we're going to expose these inefficiencies that you have, your misbehaviors, if you will, and we're going to educate you on positive behaviors. And they actually want to lean in on that because their the goal is to avoid a breach in the first place, right? For us and for the client. Paul, if our listeners wanted to learn more about Onda or get in touch, how could they do? So? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, but we, onda.ai is our website. And four days ago, we launched publicly in France and UK. So we're now starting to issue cybersecurity policies in those two markets. And we'll be in the US market sooner than later as well. Thank you, Paul, for coming on the show and everybody to listening to another episode of Failing Success. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star review. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time.